Hi, everyone. Good evening. I think I know everybody here, but I'm Alka Popper. I'm the upper school principal. We're so excited to have you all here tonight um, for our college guidance kickoff event. Um, we're sorry that we can't do it in person, but excited for tonight and what we have to share with you. Just very quickly before I hand over the mic to our college guidance team, the evening is going to be um, Basically, we're going to start together in one session. We're going to send you out into breakout rooms with some of our of our experts. And so thank you to Angela and to Maggie for being here to join with us tonight um, as some of our resident experts in test prep in college admissions, um, along with uh, Evan and Alana for being our, our experts in residence in the, our college guidance department. We are going to be recording this evening, including the breakout session. So I just want you all to know that and we'll share the recordings with you um, tomorrow. So if you miss something, there's gonna be a lot of information, don't worry, we'll share it out with you. Um, we'd love to see you. So if you're comfortable having your cameras on, feel free to show us your face so that we can feel like we're here together as a community. Um, and one last thing of housekeeping that if you're with your with your son or your daughter tonight um, and you want to join in one camera, great. But when we send you into breakout rooms, we're going to do our best if you're in two different cameras to keep families together. Um, but without further ado, again, thank you so much for joining us. Here is Mr. Evan Reed and Miss Ilana Hoffman, our college guidance department. All right, well, welcome everybody to our annual Berman Hebrew Academy College Guidance Kickoff. We are so excited for tonight. We are so excited to be here with you all, albeit virtually. Um, we've been working on these presentations and talking about this for a while now, and we just, we're so excited to be here uh, with you tonight. As, as Malka mentioned, we're, we're gonna be hearing from experts in the field and college admissions and testing. And of course, you're gonna hear from the college guidance team. Uh, but before we get into all of that, there's one big piece of information we want you all to keep in mind as we go forward. There's going to be a lot of information that we throw your way tonight. Uh, between the opening presentation and the breakout sessions, uh, it's probably going to feel a lot like drinking water out of a fire hydrant because there's just so much. And that's okay. For some of you, this is going to be a brand new experience. You've never engaged the college guidance uh, or college counseling experience or college admissions. For others of you who have done this before, uh, we, we hope deeply that some of this information lands a little bit differently. And so in that way, it might feel a little bit new. Um, but the thing to know is that we're not expecting you and nobody is expecting you to be experts in the field of college admissions. That's what we're here for. Between Ms. Hoffman and myself, we are here as a, as a resource to all of you. Uh, so please uh, keep that in mind. If you do have follow-up questions or something doesn't land right or you need something clarified, let us know, send us an email, or uh, if, you, if it's something that we need to talk about uh, in person, we can set up a Zoom, Zoom chat uh, or talk on the phone. Whatever it is, we are here to support and usher you all through uh, the college admissions experience. So with that in mind, let's introduce the team. Uh, so my name is Evan Reed. Uh, I'm the newest member of the Berman Hebrew Academy. Uh, community and so excited to be here. I started back in August. Uh, I'm uh, like Ms. Hoffman, one of the co-directors of, of College Guidance. Uh, and a little bit about me, I completed my undergrad degree at Union College in Schenectady, New York. Uh, I completed my master's degree at Teachers College uh, at Columbia University. And I've been doing, uh, I've been working in college admissions uh, since about 2006, uh, when I started working as a college admissions officer for a small liberal arts college south of Boston, uh, I worked for a short while uh, as an admissions officer for a large research university. Uh, and for the past 10 years, I've worked in college access and success uh, for a local, uh, for a national nonprofit uh, based out of uh, Northern Virginia. And, you know, something to know about me as far as why I love doing what I do, it's because of the students. That's what gets me out of bed every morning to come to work, uh, talking with students, learning about their dreams, their aspirations, uh, hearing about uh, their interesting stories, the, the wonderful, interesting things that they're doing inside the classroom and outside of the classroom. It just it really brings me a lot of joy and a lot of excitement. Uh, and, and that's really why I do what I do. Um, Ms. Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Evans. So if he's the newest member of the College Guides team, that makes me the oldest member. 
Um, I've worked with many of you before uh, with your students uh, over the past few years or with older uh, siblings. So I, I do know some of you and some of you have not yet had the chance to work with. Uh, my name is Ilana Hoffman. This is my fifth year at Berman and my eighth year in uh, the field of college counseling. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in psychology from the University of Michigan and a master's of education from Harvard and a master's of counseling from George Mason University. And I've worked with students in Prince George's County in New York City and in New Jersey. And much like Mr. Evan, it's the students that uh, keep me going that uh, I love working with students on this really exciting and unique step between childhood and adulthood as uh, young people figure out what matters to them and what they're interested in and, and what they see as the next step for them. So I'm really excited to get to uh, work with all of you on that very step. So we're aware that this whole process from this moment through the applications and the waiting uh, for news brings up a lot of feelings. So we're gonna ask you just to take uh, 30, 45 seconds to uh, put in the chat some words that describe what you all are feeling uh, about this, this process. <laughs> Thank you all. Great responses. We got everything from anxious to excited, trepidatious, relaxed. What a wonderful feeling to, to head into this with. Um, tired, concerned about the dollar signs, the whole gamut. All of these make complete sense to us. It, they're all feelings that we uh, have, have seen and experienced with families throughout this process. Um, so we're gonna hopefully address some of those feelings and uh, move forward through this evening. And, and maybe by the end of the night, you'll feel a little less, I believe one entry was profoundly ignorant. We hope to, uh, to help you with that. So we have had a, uh, junior college night for many years. And this year we have revamped it a little bit to give you the chance to uh, hear from some experts in different fields. So we're gonna start all together and give you a, a broad overview of our program. And then we're going to break out, break into three breakout rooms. We're gonna do it a little differently than you may have done it in other meetings where you're actually gonna stay in one room and our speakers are going to uh, come to you. Um, we're going to hear from Maggie Duran, who is uh, from the Office of Undergraduate Admissions at the University of Maryland. And she's gonna talk with us a little bit about what colleges are seeing when they receive your application and how they're assessing students uh, from their end. We're going to hear from Angela Kaufman and uh, she, her colleague, Elizabeth Curtin, who are, uh, from private prep, we've worked with private prep for, uh, partnered with private prep for a number of years. Um, Angela will be talking with you about the standardized testing piece of this process. Some of you have made some decisions about standardized testing and some of you are making those decisions right now. So learning a little bit about the difference between the ACT and SAT, if testing is the right choice for you and how to move forward. And you'll have a session with Mr. Evan and with me uh, going into a little bit more detail about the steps uh, that we'll go through together over the next year and a half or so uh, in the college uh, guidance process. So let's jump in. So what is college guidance? Well, 
as we were as we talked about it sort of at the, at the top of the presentation, for some of you, this is going to be brand new. You've never done it before. And for others of you, uh, again, it may feel like a new experience because this is your first time doing it with this particular child, right? We all know that each, each child is a little bit different. Their personalities are different. Their needs are different. Their goals and aspirations are different. Uh, so it's almost in some respects like going through it uh, in a whole new way. Regardless, we feel it's important for you to, to know what we're all about why we approach the work the way that we do, how it is we're gonna do that, and, and what that, is that gonna look like over the course of time. So, you know, our standpoint is that, you know, Ms. Hoffman and I firmly believe that there is a post-secondary option for every student in this class, and that we see our role as working with you students and your families to find the options that are gonna be the best fit for you, what options, are going to help you achieve those goals and those aspirations that you have for yourself. Or for some of you, if you haven't quite figured that out, well, what places are going to help you to figure out what your goals and aspirations are? Whether it's looking at a four-year school, whether they're uh, highly competitive uh, or sort of mid-range schools, state schools, or if you're considering community college options, we want to help you understand what those options are and then how to, to go about uh, pursuing them. Our philosophy of college guidance is based on two important pieces. One is relationships and the other is fit. So relationships is our connection with each of you students and your families. And over the next many months, we will spend a lot of time getting to know one another to learn about you and what you're hoping for and what uh, is gonna be the next step for you. And that will lead us to thinking about what schools are going to be the right fit. We're going to get deeper into what that means and what that looks like later in the presentation. But by formulating those relationships, we can really work as a team to uh, figure out what, what the best fit is. So the better we know you, the better we can, we can guide you um, to, find, to find that right match. So how do we support you? What does that look like? Uh, how are we gonna usher you down this journey towards college? Well, as Ms. Hoffman said, like one of our, part of our philosophy is about relationship building. It's important for us to get to know you, to students, to get to understand what your needs are, what your interests are, what your goals are, what your aspirations are. And the only way we can do that is through relationship building. But just as it's important for us to get to know you, it's equally important for you to get to know us and, and kind of understand how we think and uh, you know what sorts of a, a advice and, and how are we gonna give that advice? That's how we're gonna build trust with one another so that when we get into those stressful moments, uh, we feel like we're supporting one another. Ideally, um, our approach is we wanna teach you about the college admissions experience. We wanna uh, educate you on the process that way when it comes to making those big decisions, you feel empowered to make a decision that's right for you. And so this is gonna happen through uh, regular and frequent communications. We are gonna leverage all the technology that Berman Hebrew Academy has to offer. Certainly that involves email. Uh, hopefully all of you have been uh, reading voraciously our monthly newsletters that we've been sending out, which is a new addition uh, to the college counseling program. Uh, and through those newsletters, we will be sharing uh, relevant and meaningful information, resources, updates, and reminders. Uh, students, we do leverage Google Classroom, and that's a great way for us to communicate directly with one another, but also to share uh, handouts, worksheets, uh, important information, when college, college visits are, videos that could be helpful. Uh, and we also use a platform called Naviance. And Naviance may be new for, for some folks here, uh, but it is sort of the premier platform in not only managing your college search. So through this platform, you can actually go through and search for schools that are gonna be a good fit for you based on criteria that you enter into the, the search engine. Uh, but it is also how you're gonna manage your applications. It's how you're gonna communicate to us what schools you're thinking about applying to, what schools you are actually applying to. And then we actually use that platform to send off all the materials. So when it comes time to apply, we use that to send off your teacher uh, recommendations, our school profile, the whole secondary school report, which includes your transcript and our letter of recommendation. Uh, we're gonna host seminars and workshops during the school day for students. Uh, and we will cover topics like uh, 
creating your own standardized testing plan, um, uh, preparation plan, excuse me, uh, how to define fit for yourself, uh, how to build your college list, how to use Naviance, how to even log in and, and start using that tool. Uh, we hope to, uh, well, we're going to host another event coming up in January, which we've been promoting through the newsletter, and that's all about paying for college. And in time, we may actually be able to add on more events. Uh, again, trying to bring in experts uh, so that you all can get the information that you need uh, about a particular topical area in college admissions. Uh, and then, of course, the, the crux of what we do is one-on-one is -on -one support. So working directly with students and families. Uh, and providing that individualized advice uh, rather than sort of uh, uh, things on a global or group, group scale. So, you know, we've given you a lot of overview. When are we starting? When, when is this happening? Well, it's starting now. In fact, it has been going on for years and years as you become the students that you are now, but this is the official start of of our work together. And we recognize that there are a million steps between now and graduation to get through this process. We're aware of that. So I will quote the amazing uh, Japanese author, Hiroki Murakami, who said that one foot in front of the other, repeat as often as necessary to finish. So we are going to take this whole process one step at a time. You don't need to have every, piece of what's ahead, we will guide you uh, throughout the, the process. And, and we will be providing you with, with all of the information that you need along the way. So let's take a very quick overview of what the next uh, few months will look like. In 11th grade, wow, check one off, college guidance kickoff event. Here we are. Um, Mr. Evan mentioned some of the other workshops that we'll be hosting, and you'll be getting more information about that. Uh, in January, right after the uh, start of 2022, you will get a message from one of us and a link to schedule your initial college guidance meeting, and that's where we'll really start those individual discussions about uh, what it is that uh, you're thinking of and getting some guidance for you about what may be next. Um, those uh, workshops will continue into the spring. Uh, we hope that you'll have the opportunity to do some college visits. So we'll talk to you about how to maximize that. Um, one of the major pieces that we work on towards the end of the school year is getting started on writing your college essay, which is a really important part of your application and a college essay is quite different than most essays you've written in your life. So we're gonna um, work with you and work with your English teachers to help you get started on that so that you can continue working into the summer which Mr. Evan is now gonna talk about. Yeah, I get the fun time. So when we think about summertime, summertime is fun time, right? This is when we think about time away from school, time away from homework, uh, maybe putting off those summer reading assignments until the last two days before the start of school, uh, going to the beach, spending time with family, barbecues, all that good stuff. But summertime is also a good opportunity to knock off some of those things on our college admission to-do list. Uh, so why is that? Well, students and, and, and parents, let's think about this for a second. If we think about what fall semester typically looks like for a student um, or in your lives, uh, it probably involves obviously going to school, taking some challenging courses, teachers assigning tons of homework and projects. Uh, maybe some of you have a part-time job that you work during the week or on the weekends. Uh, some of you probably have some caretaking responsibilities at home, plus you're involved in clubs and activities. Maybe you have leadership positions, uh, all these things. So I think we can all agree that during the fall, you're probably pretty busy, right? Well, if we look forward to the fall of 12th grade, not only are you gonna have all those things going on, but you're also gonna have applying to college, right? So you're gonna have one more thing on top of all that. So summertime can be an awesome opportunity for you to really push yourself forward on your journey and completing uh, your, your college applications. Uh, so what are some things that we're gonna encourage you to work on over the summers? We'll continue to work on your essays, revising those. Uh, maybe you find you come up with some new ideas and, and trying to, uh, to, to tease those ideas out. Continuing to research schools and, and build out and refine your list. 
Uh, maybe there are schools on your list and you're not really sure about. Well, summertime's a, a great opportunity uh, to, to, in, to really investigate, uh, not only by doing virtual uh, college visits, but maybe even in going and in, in doing some physical college visits. If you're going on a road trip with your family for, uh, for a week or so, um, see if there are any schools that are on the path, that pathway that you're taking uh, on your family trip. Uh, start drafting a list of your activities. Um, this actually, you know, many people think about uh, their activities list or their extracurricular resume as something that would come rather easy. Uh, but I think when students actually sit down to do it, they realize it's a bit cumbersome. So summertime can be a great time to start cataloging uh, everything that you've done from ninth grade uh, up until present. Um, you know, this is also a good opportunity to start searching for scholarships. Uh, a lot of the large dollar scholarships, we're talking maybe like $10,000 or more, typically their application deadlines are in the fall. Uh, so that October, November time period. Uh, so the only way to, to find out uh, if you're eligible is to start that search early on and begin even maybe working on some of those applications. All right, senior year probably seems like a very long way off. It will be here before you know it. And obviously senior year is when we take all of this work that we've done together and you will be um, completing and submitting all of your applications. Over the last few weeks, we've had the exciting opportunity to, to sit with a lot of seniors as they hit submit um, and, and sent their applications out into the world. So throughout the, the fall and winter, we will be working uh, very closely with each one of you to complete all of the steps of your application, to help you with your financial aid up and scholarship applications. And then our hope for all of you is that by the spring, you've received a lot of great news from admissions offices and you have a list of, of excellent choices and we are uh, able to help you figure out which school is going to be lucky enough to have you on their campus. Um, so we have a lot of work to do before that point, but we're gonna, we're gonna get there together. So we say thank you. The thank you that's missing from this list is uh, Todaraba, but we thank you for spending this time with us tonight and um, taking the time to, to uh, share your stories and students with us. Um, we are going to split up into rooms and we will see all of you in our breakout session and we'll come back together briefly at the end. So Sarah is gonna do some breakout room magic. See you. I think you can take it away if, if you're ready. Perfect, there you go. I always like to give folks like a minute to get off the Zoom commute because I know that can take a second. Let me put my phone up so I don't go over time. It's the last thing I wanna do this evening. Beautiful, well, hi everyone. Uh, it's very nice to meet you all virtually. My name is Maggie Duran and I uh, work at the University of Maryland College Park, so not too far away from all of you. Uh, we're somewhat neighbors here in the wonderful state of Maryland. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you all. Let me do that real quick. Wonderful. All right, so hopefully you are seeing my presentation now uh, about the University of Maryland. Uh, fair warning, since I work for the University of Maryland, I can technically only speak on their behalf, uh, but a lot of the information I'm going to be sharing tonight, I'll be framing from kind of two different lenses. One, as a college representative in general, and B, talking a little bit specifically about the University of Maryland. Um, one thing I can't emphasize enough, and I'm glad it was shared earlier, how folks were feeling, is this is the beginning. This is the start line. It's okay to feel nervous and scared. It's okay to walk away from tonight still feeling like you have a lot of questions. But by being here on an evening like tonight, you are taking the big important step of getting started. Um, and hopefully I have some great information to share with you all about these steps and what colleges are looking for. Oh, there we go, I'm jumping ahead. So what is it that colleges are looking for? I wish I had the exact right formula. And you know, if Johnny does X, Y, and Z, he's gonna be all set. But one scary truth about the college process is you don't always know what that college is looking for. This can sound a little bit like the opposite of what I just said. Let's get you less nervous. Let's demystify this process. But the truth is school to school, their enrollment goals might change a little bit each year. And that's not always something you're gonna be aware of. So it's okay to go into this process nervous and you're not always gonna necessarily get the news you're hoping for, but one door closes and another you know, 
opens via fate. I promise you there is a wonderful, beautiful light at the end of the tunnel. Um, there's a fabulous statistic I was just hoping to find, but you know, more than half of the schools in the United States admit over half of their applicants. Your students are going to college and students are out there, you're going to college. Um, so advice I will show you later is about keeping an open mind. But in terms of what college you're looking for, this is going to vary a little bit school to school. And even then, you know, enrollment goals are going to change a little bit year to year. And that's OK. That's why you have a broad list of schools that you're looking at. And that's why you have to keep an open mind uh, throughout the process as you go. But in terms of how and what schools are looking at, I think it's helpful to first kind of talk about the kinds of application reviews that take place. Now, some of the three main ones that you're going to hear as you are looking through different schools, as you understand how they review their applicants, are going to be holistic, data-driven, and open enrollment. I'll actually work my way from the bottom and come back on up, uh, but open enrollment is going to speak to a school where uh, if you apply and you meet certain qualifications, you're going to be directly admitted. So a really good example of this might be a community college. Uh, typically for community college, you may just need a high school diploma and a GED or, and or a GED to be directly admitted to their programs. Secondly would be data driven. That's the school that's gonna say to you, they make it a little bit easier. Uh, you know, if you have this test score and or this GPA, and if you're above it, you're gonna be admitted and you're below it, you're not going to be admitted. So it's very data driven. They're really just taking certain metrics and that's how they're making their decision. Last and my favorite on the list, I'm a little biased because it's what the University of Maryland employs, is what we call a holistic admission review. And that means you're taking a large variety of factors, um, can be a bit of a sliding scale to review all of the applicants to your school. Now, with all of these different uh, admission models, really, it is typically that school's goal in all cases to build a freshman class that is going to be talented, that is going to be academically prepared for their institution, and of course, is going to be involved and ready to take on all that their school can offer them. There are a couple of different deadlines. Uh, I think something unique to the college process and those who have had older students go through this process can certainly vouch for is there's a lot of jargon. Um, so certainly if there's any jargon I didn't elaborate on and flush out later, we have plenty of time for questions later on, but let's dissect some of the jargon around the different kinds of deadlines. First and foremost is gonna be early decision. An early decision deadline is gonna have a binding contract. So essentially you are saying to that school, if I am admitted, I am coming here. So that is a big decision. Uh, it is a contract. You know, you're signing your name on the dotted line as a student. Um, it's important to know what that means and what that looks like, that you might not get a chance to look at your financial aid package before you say, yes, I am coming because you're going early decision. But at some schools, that might be able to give you a competitive edge. So it's certainly not a bad decision as long as you're well aware of all that it entails. Uh, early action, or what some schools call their priority deadline, that is typically going to be a little bit earlier in the year, as you can probably guess by the first part of its title. Uh, and in a lot of cases, it'll give you best consideration for admission. Now, I should back up and say, I think one of the hardest parts about the college process, and I remember it super well from my time as a senior in high school, is that very often the answer is a little bit different school to school. So in some cases, early action is just earlier and it doesn't give you priorities to consideration, but at some schools, it might actually give you a competitive edge. So specifically at the University of Maryland, I'll speak on our behalf, um, our early action applicants are given priority consideration for admission. So you give yourself that competitive edge by applying EA versus someone who is in our regular decision pool. Now, regular decision, at least at the University of Maryland, uh, it can be a little bit more competitive and they you would not be reviewed for our merit-based scholarships. Now, at some other schools, regular decision just might be a little bit later in the year, but you're equally as uh, reviewed as if you were early action. So again, I know that's a tough part. Uh, I'm gonna talk about staying organizing a little bit later in my presentation, but just make sure you're paying close attention as you look at different schools and add them to your list to what kinds of deadlines they have and what it means school to school. Last, uh, and I think one of the most exciting deadlines would be a rolling decision. This means that once that school's application opens, they are beginning to accept applications and reviewing them as they come in. So it might be the case that you apply to a school and you hear two weeks later. That could be really exciting if you are interested in a rolling uh, deadline school because you might have some good news in your pocket 
September 30th or the very beginning of October. Um, so of course that's very exciting. Unfortunately, the University of Maryland does not offer rolling admission. Uh, we just have early action and regular. But again, you wanna pay close attention as you're starting to build your college list throughout junior year to what each of these deadlines are and what it means school to school. Now, I know I mentioned a little bit earlier when we talked about types of admission applic or application reviews that the University of Maryland used a holistic review model. Now, we don't wanna keep that secret. You know, what are the factors we use in our holistic review? So we keep them public. They are on our website anytime you take a, wanna take a look and I am sharing them here with you. Now, when we sit down as an admission committee in my office, we, again, are really intending to build a freshman class that, of course, is going to be prepared to succeed academically, but is also going to be diverse and bring different talents and perspectives to our campus. So these are all of the factors that we use as an admission committee to review our students. Again, I can only speak on behalf of the University of Maryland, but I think in many cases, these will look very similar to other schools that you and your students are thinking about uh, who use a holistic review model. Now, the thing about holistic is it's not a rubric. So each of these factors doesn't have an exact percent it matters in each student's review. Uh, I'm sure parents of multiple students know that even you know, two siblings might have different perspectives and lived experiences. And so these factors can really vary a little bit student to student. I think a good way to exemplify that is through something like extracurriculars. So you'll see that on the left-hand side that extracurricular activities is one of the factors that we consider. And we might have student A over here who is super involved in their high school and their community and extracurriculars are a big part of their story. But we might have student B over here in the middle who maybe works 20 to 30 hours outside of the classroom and understandably doesn't have the same amount of time for extracurriculars. Maybe student C over here uh, has a special role in their family. Maybe they pick up a younger sibling from school every day and help them with homework and get dinner on the table and understandably not, might, might not be able to work or have extracurriculars. You know, all three students spent their time in a valuable way, uh, but extracurriculars is a big part of one student, student's factors and not so much a part of the other two. And this really goes across the board with all of the different factors that we use in our holistic review model. Don't think of this as a checklist because um, truthfully how the factors are significant to your story might vary from your best friend or your neighbor or even your sibling. One thing you will notice as you start to review these is that about a third of them are academic in nature. For a school like Maryland, at least, uh, that's all I can speak for, that can be a big part of our decision because we do wanna make sure that students are academically ready to succeed when they get to a rigorous school like the University of Maryland. Now, those are the 26 factors uh, that we use for a holistic review model. You know, how do we go about figuring out how they're significant to your, your story or your student's story? Now, of course, step one in applying to school, this one probably seems fairly obvious, is filling out their application. Now, as you build your college list, you're gonna notice that different schools have different types of applications. Some of the multi-institution applications that you might be familiar with are the Common App and the My Coalition application. Now, what I mean by multi-institution application is that you'd be able to fill out one profile and main section of your application and send it off to multiple schools with either out having to make any changes at all, or maybe just including some additional or supplemental information. If the Common App sounds more familiar than the Coalition, uh, that's probably because the Common App has been around since I wanna say 1974 and has a little over 900 schools on it. Coalition is fairly new. It's been around since 2016 and has a little under 200 schools on it. But both again have big platforms they can use to apply to multiple schools. Now, some institutions might be on both. The University of Maryland is an example of that. That doesn't mean you have to apply using both applications, but rather students get to decide what application is gonna work best for them. I find personally that a lot of students who are applying to the University of Maryland tend to have a lot of overlap with their other schools on the common application. There's just more variety on it. It's been around a little bit longer. Uh, so often that's what works best for them. But if you wanna apply using the coalition, absolutely you can as well. Now, some schools are actually going to have their specific applications uh, that are homegrown for their institution. So, uh, you know, back in my day when I was applying to my state school of Rutgers, uh, my state flagship, they had their very own application. So it wasn't Common App. It was directly through Rutgers. And that might be the case in some schools that your student's applying to. Uh, if they have multiple options, very often, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter which one you use as long as you complete the application itself. Oops. 
All right. And so those are a little about the application uh, formats. What goes into the application? Now, some of this information that I have listed in front of me is part of the application. So it's included in the Common App, for example. Some of it is going to be sent in separately. Now, that sounds like a lot when it's listed out this way, but I promise you, after junior year, a lot of this information is already going to be set, and it's more just about organizing, getting it sent in appropriately and on time for different deadlines. So this is what the University of Maryland requires. I think you'll find in a lot of cases, this mirrors a lot of schools, particularly those that are like the university, uh, but maybe they uh, require a little bit less or a little bit more than we do in terms of our checklists. So the first is the application and fee itself. That one is pretty much goes without saying, we can't review you without you applying. And within the application, we get your basic demographic information, your name, your date of birth, where you're going to high school, uh, things of that nature. The application fee of most schools is going to vary somewhere between $45 and $85, but very often there are application fee waivers available um, if there's a financial need or if you had a fee waiver in place for the SAT or ACT, um, or if you know there's an extenuating circumstance, and some schools will actually waive it if you just go on a tour. Unfortunately, here's where I'm the bearer of bad news. Uh, UMD is not one of those schools, uh, but certainly if there's any questions about the fee, we can chat about that later. I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit uh, for two things that are part of the application. So the activities list or resume, that's going to include any and all things that you or you or your student has been a part of over the last couple of years. Um, and that for us is built into the common application. Uh, there will also be the essay and kind of uniquely, the essay is one of the only places a student's voice actually comes directly through. You know, in the letters of recommendation, someone else is writing it, but in the essay, it's your voice as a student telling your story, whether it's your past, your present, your future, you can really go in a lot of different directions here. Some schools will have essays general that uh, are, you know, specific to their institution. Some will use them generally from the common application. Again, this will vary a little bit school to school. Outside of the application, many institutions like Maryland will require one teacher and one counselor letter of recommendation and probably not too surprisingly, a copy of your official high school transcripts. Uh, if you are someone who has attended more than one high school, very often can be helpful to have your current school send your original transcript so we can see the grades uh, as they were originally listed at your uh, first institution. Now, I know this is a big question and topic these days, uh, which is standardized test scores. Now, we are test optional this year and we are next year. So good for planning purposes for our juniors. Um, that we actually are not requiring the SAT or ACT. And last year, it might be helpful to know, about half of our applicants submitted test scores, about half of them did not. So it really was kind of 50-50. Now, we went test optional to make things a little bit more accessible in the pandemic for our students. Not everyone is able to test. A lot of dates last year were getting canceled. Not everyone is able to prepare in the same way that maybe they would have been previously. So we went test optional in order to uh, make that a little bit more accessible to our students. Now, test optional might mean something different school to school. Uh, speaking for the University of Maryland, optional is optional. So if you're test optional, you are still reviewed for scholarships. Students would still be reviewed for special opportunities like our honors college. But of course, you want to make sure this is the case at each school you were thinking about, because if it takes you out of the running for scholarships, then maybe you want to consider sending your test scores in. Uh, some schools will also have a portal where you go on to check your status. Um, but uh, that'll vary a little bit institution to institution. I know I'm seeing my one minute warning. I promise I'm almost at the end. I wanna leave time for questions. Uh, I thought a quick little chart, I know this looks a little uh, basic, might just kind of help to give an idea of what happens to an early admission or an early, uh, early action application at the University of Maryland. Well, step one is hitting submit and we get that student's application. Step two, at least at the University of Maryland, you're going to be reviewed by the Office of Undergraduate Admission. Now, the University of Maryland is a school that uses what we call major blind admissions. So we don't actually review a student by major, but some programs might have an additional review. So what that means is some students will be directly admitted to their first choice of major, but some students might not be directly admitted to their first choice. And we can dive into what that means during some of our Maryland summer workshops. If everybody can see this. Excellent, thank you so much. Sometimes I think I'm sharing something and I'm not, so I just wanna make sure. So, okay, so I'm here to talk about the SAT and the ACT. And um, 
my colleague Elizabeth should be in here as well. So, but this is our contact information. And at any point, please reach out um, if you have any questions. So, but I'm going to go ahead and, and skip ahead to what we offer academic tutoring, test prep, executive function, um, college admissions that you all are in fabulous hands with your college admissions counselors at Berman. Um, you're one of the few schools who really has such an amazing program. So consider yourself very lucky. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about the ACT versus the SAT. And the big burning question right now, and I'm sure you all have talked about this and we'll be hearing all about this and everybody's chatting, um, is test optional, right? So what do we do? So some of you may have already made the decision to scrap the SAT or ACT. Some of you have maybe thought about it and just want some more information. So the biggest thing that we always tell our families is, you know, make sure it matches your academic profile. And I always tell families too, look, the ACT and the SAT are down the line when, when you're applying to colleges and what colleges are looking for. Colleges are looking for, when you apply, the very first thing are your courses, right? Your course load, your rigor of courses, your grades, your extracurriculars, and then test scores if you decide to submit them. So know that these are not the end all be all. They do not define students. But it is something, you know, if colleges are still requiring them or that they're test optional, you have the choice to take them. Um, and again, a, the difference between, so some schools are test optional, some schools are test blind. So if they're test blind, they won't even look at your ACT or SAT scores. If they're test optional, they will consider them and look at them. Okay. So we will get started. This is a little bit about what I'm gonna talk about, the SAT, the ACT. What are the similarities? What are the differences? How do I choose them? When do I start preparing? And how are colleges viewing them? So again, a little bit um, about the test optional or the test blind and how they're looking at them. And also, it doesn't matter what college you're applying to, They uh, all colleges will accept either the ACT or their SAT. When I was taking these tests many years ago um, in the area, everybody here took the SAT. Not very many people took the ACT. It was more of a Midwest test or certain colleges wanted to see the ACT. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people didn't. So sometimes in our minds, we think, oh, I should just take the SAT. But colleges don't care which test that you take. And because the, the tests themselves are similar, uh, to a point, they also have a lot of differences. And therefore, taking both of them and figuring out which test is a better fit for your child is really the best route to go. Okay, so I'll run through here the ACT versus the SAT. Um, the ACT and the SAT are similar in content. They both cover English grammar. They both cover reading comprehension. They both cover math up to pre-calculus and a little bit of statistics. The biggest difference between the two tests is the timing because the ACT is a very fast paced test. And you'll see here, now I've included three hours and 35 minutes in the length of the ACT here. That 35 minutes is the optional writing essay portion, which most schools are not at, uh, looking at anymore. It's really a lot of military institutes um, at this point. Um, so you will see the three hours, there's 235 questions in three hours on the ACT, and there's 176 questions in three hours on the SAT. So again, that's that fast paced type of test there. The SAT is also a very analytical, problem solving, critical thinking type of test. So if your child is more on that route, right, um, then the SAT might be a better test for them and they might prefer it. The ACT is a much more fast paced, black and white, all multiple choice, very strategy driven test. Um, and some students prefer that. Some students don't love the fast pacedness of the ACT um, and they might prefer the more critical thinking side of the SAT. The ACT is out of 36 points. It has four sections and always goes in the same order, English and then math and then reading and science. Each of those sections are worth 36 points. You add them up and average them out to get a composite score out of 36. The SAT is out of 1600 points. 800 is verbal and 800 is math. So that's another big difference between the two tests. The SAT is 
English grammar and reading comprehension, and that's worth 800 points. The SAT is math with a calculator and math without a calculator, and that's worth 800 points. Mm -hmm. So if your student is a strong math student, the SAT also might be a good fit for them. The English and writing and language sections, called English on the ACT, it's called writing and language on the SAT, are the two sections within both of the tests that are the most similar. So they both cover English grammar, usage, mechanics, um, it really covers um, content like when to use whom versus who, when to use a colon versus a semicolon, comma splices. So I always tell students too, how did you get that answer? You got it right. How did you get it? Well, it looks right. It sounded right. And yes, that is one of the um, how we solve these answers, right? But you also, for the English or the writing and language section, have to know the rule behind it. So that's really what they're testing. The math section on both of the tests, again, cover algebra, geometry, algebra two, pre-calculus, and a little bit of statistics. The difference is how they are presented on each of the tests. So on the ACT, it's all multiple choice. Um, there is more geometry and on the ACT, and there's more algebra on the SAT. On the SAT, again, you have the two sections, one with a calculator and one without. On the ACT, you can use a calculator for the whole math section. On the SAT, you have the calculator and the non-calculator, you have multiple choice, and then you have something called student-produced responses. So the last five, maybe to 12 questions, depending on the sections of the test, we call them student-produced responses where you don't have multiple choice options to choose from. Um, and there's more problem, word problems on the SAT. And again, there's more algebra on the SAT. So those are the biggest differences between the two math sections on the ACT and the SAT. On the reading section, the reading sections, they both have different genres of passages to answer questions. The ACT has more humanities-based passages, literary narrative, social science, natural science. Um, they just announced, the ACT just announced last month that they're now going to start including graphs and charts in the reading section. And because the science section on the ACT already has those, we were pretty well prepared. And so going forth with the ACT test, they are going to be including more graphs and charts. Um, on their reading section. So again, the reading section on the ACT, more humanities-based passages, there could be paired passages where you're reading two passages on the same topic and then answering questions. On the SAT, there are also different genres of passages, but there are more what we call founding documents passages. It's American history dating back to the 1700s. So you do have to know a little bit about history. So students who like history actually might like the reading section on the SAT. So you do have to know a little bit about American history. Um, questions about Articles of the Confederation, speeches by Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela. So we know the common types of questions that will occur on these tests. So we sort of front load students um, on this type of content. The science section, this is a biggie always. I often have students say, I'm never taking the ACT, I don't like science. Or I love science, I'm totally taking the ACT. Um, and it's, which is fabulous, except that um, it has nothing to do with science <laughs> and they're not testing your science. So the science section really has reading comprehension passages, you're reading graduate level science labs, um, and you're answering questions about them. And I'll give you a big hint, read the questions and go find the answers. So we, like I said earlier on, the ACT is a very strategic test. That's the, that's the science section. The science section also has a lot more um, charts and graphs and data. So again, the ACT is a very visual test. It's got geometry, shapes, transformations, charts, graphs you're looking at, um, and all multiple choice. And then the SAT, although it doesn't have a science section, they do put science passages, these natural science passages, in their reading section. So though, although you think, oh, there's no science on the SAT, they are actually putting it into the reading sections. 
the writing or the essay, I mentioned a, a, a touch briefly on that earlier. The SAT does not have an essay. They actually got rid of it this year. So there is no more optional essay. And then the essay on the ACT, um, there still is a, an essay. Again, most colleges are not requiring it. Um, I actually met with a, a family yesterday and they asked me, my daughter is such a fabulous writer. Um, will it hurt if she takes the essay? And it won't hurt. I just don't know if colleges will be looking at it. And then incorrect answers. If you don't know something, you run out of time, guess away. Because there's no penalties for wrong answers. So, you know, choose a letter and bubble in. Um, if they say five minutes left, five minutes left in the timing, you can go ahead and just follow away because you might get something right, but you won't get any penalties for wrong answers. These are just some, um, if you could like to um, solve some math problems, you can, but these are just some examples of the ACT. Remember how I was talking about how it's a very visual test, right? So you're looking at shapes, you're solving the answers for them. So this is, um, examples of the ACT types of problems. And this is an example or a couple of examples of the SAT no calculator types of problems. You can take a screenshot and you can send me your answers later. <laughs> and then these are examples of the gridding questions on the SAT. So again, at the end of each of the math sections, the last five to 12 um, are grid ins. So here you have to solve for X and then you would have to bubble in the answer. So if it was, you know, 75, you would write 75 or if the answer is not for this one, but is 25.34, you have to write in 25.34. And then this is an example of the SAT with a calculator type of problem. And again, there's more word problems on the SAT than on the ACT. And sometimes it can be a little tricky, which has always been the style of the SAT. So I always tell my students, sometimes on the SAT word problems, they might give you a formula and you think, ha ha, I should use that formula clearly to solve this problem. And the SAT thinks, ha ha, I hope he or she knows not to use the formula to solve the problem. So it's that problem solving, like, wait, why'd they put that in there? It has nothing to do with what they're asking me which is a very SAT style question. Um, who should take the SAT and ACT? So we actually, we actually take them as a company. Um, the tutors take every time a, a new test is released. So um, we actually write our own curriculum. We update our curriculum all the time. Um, so we actually dubbed the SAT for deep thinkers. Almost if your student likes to overanalyze questions um, and really think about them because you have the time to do so on the SAT. Um, and they give you more time because those are the types of questions that they're, that they're putting on there. Um, academic thrill seekers, strong students with strong reading skills, deeper level of processing, um, inferring, you know, if you're a good type of uh, a, a student who is, does really well with inference type questions. The ACT, um, students, a lot more students take the ACT than the SAT. Um, I think it's just because they, you know, it is a pretty clear cut black and white test. Once you learn the strategies, you'll, you'll do pretty well. You still do have to, you know, learn content. And it is, I always tell students, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint, right? You do have to go back and do a lot of reviewing of algebra and geometry, um, grammar rules, going through and remembering some of the reading comprehension strategies and skills and things like that. So. Um, but it is a pretty time, you know, pressure type of test. So you definitely want to feel comfortable with that. But again, with strategies, it really becomes a non-issue. How to decide, um, we are, again, we always have our students take a full ACT test and a recent test, a full SAT practice test. And then we actually, we actually created an algorithm we basically, for lack of a better term, dump in all the questions and answers. It gives me a report as to which test is a better fit. Clearly, we look at the overall score. We look at each individual section score. But we also look at, you know, how did the student do on SAT-only questions and ACT-only questions? And then I get feedback from the student. Um, how, which, which test did they prefer? 
Um, next Sunday, we're actually offering, I believe it's just for juniors. Okay. Um, we're offering pra a practice test at Berman on Sunday um, to take for the ACT as well. And I believe you all just took the SAT, the juniors. Um, and so, you know, the PSAT. And so it is something that you could compare. Um, but just to note, the PSAT is not a full test. It's just a, a short and condensed version of a full SAT. When to start? That's a great question. There is no right time you have to start. I always tell families, do not listen to your neighbor. Do not listen to your hairdresser or anybody else in the world that's saying we've already been prepping for, you know, 10 months. Um, everybody is different. I had, did have students start this summer because they didn't have a lot going on. I had students who are starting now. I have students who will start this winter and I have some who will start this spring. Um, there is no right time. It really depends on your child and if you feel or they feel that they're ready to begin. So you have up through, I usually recommend taking the first test at least by June of their junior year, if not sooner. And you do can still take it your senior year up through December as well. These are just some of the books that we published. I know we have like less than a minute, so I just wanted to. Um, if we get cut off, this is a learning differences report. Um, we have a lot of students who have learning differences. We actually create a learning plan based on their strategies or specific needs. Um, if they have a learning plan already in place at school or an ed psych eval, they share it with me. I come up with a summary and I share with the tutor. It just, it's not, no extra cost. This is something that we do to help our students um, and our tutors to make sure that they're using the best tools and strategies to work with the student. Oh, that was so nice. Somebody just commented about working with private prep. Um, and so our, our score reports. So again, it's a very individualized approach. Um, this is not a CAN program. We really do focus on the student strengths and weaknesses. And we um, come up with a, a very you know, targeted and individualized tutoring plan for each student. Um, and then we already talked a little bit about these. Colleges accept both tests. Um, we usually don't recommend prepping for both tests. Um, that's why I figure out. All right. Oh, we got, I pulled out of one room and <laughs> I know. popped up over here. <laughs> all right. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see you all fit on, on one screen. Glad to, to be with you um, to talk a little bit more specifically about uh, the next steps in this process. Yeah, so this is it, the third and final. You've done it, the marathon. You, you've made it to the, to the last session. You should give yourselves a pat on the back. You're still awake, you're still with us. Um, so welcome to the College Guidance Breakout Session. What are we gonna be talking about with just that, College Guidance? and how it all starts today. And arguably, it, students, your journey to college started well before today, and we'll talk about that. So by the end of our session, our goal is that, you know, everyone will have a clear understanding of everybody's roles and responsibilities in this experience, not just the students, but students and parents and the college guidance teams, that we are all working together uh, to, to really try to achieve the same, the same end result uh, and, and what that's going to look like. Uh, that this journey began well before today uh, and that there was a lot of hard work that's already happened. Um, and we're going to start having a conversation around fit. This is an important uh, concept when, when it comes to the college admissions experience and, and defining that can be a really valuable and useful tool um, as, as you all move forward um, in applying to, it's searching for schools and applying to schools. Uh, and then at the end, we will go over what are the next steps uh, for everybody? And thinking about uh, some, we'll have some homework assignments that folks can work on, uh, as well as what some additional programming that's gonna be coming up uh, in the next few months. So who's in charge? Who is this process all about? Students, you take center stage in the whole 
college process because this is about, about you and what's the next step on your educational journey. So you are the star of this process, but you are by no means in it alone. We are, you can see lots of people on this call, we are all in it as, as a team and we have slightly different roles to play, but it's all a part of your process. So students, you have the main responsibility of doing the self-reflection involved in, in thinking about what, what it is you want, what it is you want to uh, do next, what you might, what you want to study, where this takes you, and then you're doing the actual work. We are going to help you with your applications and your essays, and your teachers are going to write letters on your behalf, but you're doing the actual work of completing each of those steps and uh, working with us to make sure that you've done each part thoroughly, keeping an eye on deadlines, uh, and making sure that everything that needs to be uh, handled in this process gets taken care of. Parents, your role is to support your student and provide as much guidance as they need. You know your children the best, so you know that some Students need a lot of nudging and handholding and reminding, and then maybe another reminder and then one more reminder. And some of you know that all of those things are going to be completely counterproductive for your child. So you are gonna wanna let them take the reins and be independent in this process. What you will be providing throughout is emotional support. This is a really exciting, but also stressful and, um, difficult time for a lot of students. So by being supportive and listening, uh, you're going to be providing your child with, with what they need. Uh, another important piece for you as parents is thinking through and talking openly about the financial piece and what's going to be realistic for your family and what it is that uh, you can provide financially and then doing some of the, the paperwork and the financial aid information that colleges will need to let you know how much um, funding they can provide for you. And our role uh, as your college guidance team is to support you and educate you about each step of this process. We mentioned earlier all of the different workshops and programs that we're going to be offering for you as a class and for you as parents, and then also the one-on-one -on -one individual uh, meetings that we will have uh, throughout this whole process and getting to know uh, each other and also giving you the chance to complete each part of the application process um, to present yourself in the best light possible. Uh, another important role that we as the, the college guidance team has is connecting with college admissions offices at various universities to help them understand bourbon to help them understand what our dual curriculum is all about and how it is that we're preparing our students to be valuable members of their campus community. So we work with uh, college admissions offices to help them understand what it is that each of you will be bringing, uh, providing to their campus. So we're each taking on some important parts of, of this whole um, process on your behalf, students. You know, when we think about the college admissions experience, we tend to focus in on 11th grade and 12th grade for the obvious reasons, right? Uh, you know, in 11th grade, this is time for standardized testing and starting to think about um, researching schools, maybe visiting some campuses, and of course, in 12th grade, applying to college. But realistically, the reality of all this is that your college admissions experience started well before today. We're just launching it into the stratosphere tonight. Students, take a moment. Think back to ninth grade, 10th grade, maybe even this year a little bit. Think about all the decisions that you've labored over, the time you've invested in, in deciding, do I take an accelerated or, not, or an honors class? Or do I take on a few more honors classes? Do I try to take on an AP class or two this year? Right? Do I take those more challenging courses? Do I, um, you know, do I join a club or organization uh, that I'm really passionate about, but maybe it's a bit of a risk because none of my friends are really into this. So I'm kind of out there and I feel a little bit alone. Do I take the risk of taking on a leadership responsibility? 
or role within a club or organization? Do I pick up a part-time job, right? Think about times that you've had to say no to, uh, to friends and family because you needed to stay home to work on a project or finish that paper or, or, or prepare for a quiz or a test the next day, right? All of these decisions that you've made, all these sacrifices that you've made have led you to this moment right here, right? Celebrate yourself, celebrate your hard work. It's important because ultimately it's that, it's those efforts, both small and large, that will ultimately help you be successful, not only in the college admissions journey, but also in college itself. Now, as we, we talked about earlier, the, the term that comes up most often when, when we think about college admissions is fit, right? Uh, and, but sometimes it's really difficult to understand what fit means. And so Ms. Hoff and I are going to go through that. Before we do, we're kind of curious to kind of poll everybody, kind of see where everybody's at. So kind of curious to know what everybody thinks fit means. So maybe in the chat, if you can take the next 15 seconds, just jot down a word or two. When, when you hear fit, what does that mean to you? Feeling content yet challenged. Yes, I like that. There's no right or wrong answer here. It's not a test, promise. Matching up program size, cost activities. Yes, yep, absolutely. You're hired now as the third member of the Berman College Guidance Team. Any other thoughts? All right, those are, oh, here we go. Finding a school that is appropriate for a student's interests and academic abilities. Yes, fourth member of the College Guidance Team. Welcome aboard. All these things are all very, very true, right? So when we think about fit, uh, just like we, we like a nice pair of shoes to fit our feet just right, we want the school that we're applying to to fit our, our personality, our needs, our goals, our aspirations just right. Um, so fit is super, super important and super helpful because it is the filter by which students you will use to sift through the nearly 4,000 colleges and universities that are out there to find the ones that are the right ones for you, right? Now, just as it's important to understand your own personality and what that means for the college experience, it's also helpful as it will kind of force you to figure out what the school's identity is. So just like you are your own person and you have your own identity, schools do as well. Now they, they desperately try to be a little bit of something for everybody, but the reality is they can't be, they shouldn't be. And, and, and they it just, it's not possible, right? Each school has its own identity, its own little culture, right? We think about a good example is University of Chicago. They're looking for the quirky student. And if you don't believe me, Go Google the University of Chicago Supplemental Essays and you'll see exactly what I mean, right? Brown University is looking for the independent learner through its open curriculum. Johns Hopkins University has a heavy emphasis on academic research. So its entire program, both academic and extracurricular, is really geared towards preparing, for student, preparing students for uh, a life of academic research. So each school has its own little thing, right? And so as you understand fit for yourself, you'll figure out whether or not that school is going to help you achieve those things that, that you're looking to achieve. But let's dig into what fit, what actually goes into defining fit for oneself, because it is a very personal definition, right? One student's definition of fit should be and is different from another. Absolutely. I've heard it said that college is a fit to be made, not a race to be run. So it's not about what fits everybody else. It's about what fits you. Um, in the College Guidance Handbook that you'll be receiving um, after this program, it goes into much greater detail about each of these categories, but I'm going to give you a few examples of the kind of things you may have already started thinking about or that you may want to think about as you begin doing research and visits to different colleges. Um, for example, thinking about the student body. Furman, very small school. 
the, for some students, the thought of going to a campus with 30 or 40,000 students is thrilling after coming from such a small high school. And for some students, it's terrifying. And they may feel that a school of about 2,000 students is going to be more nurturing and a, a more comfortable environment. Um, thinking about things like where do students live? Do most students live on campus or are students commuting from home, which creates a very different type of campus feel? You're going to want to do a good bit of research about Jewish life on campus and thinking about what, what it is that you want uh, in terms of a Jewish community. There are a lot of colleges that have very large Jewish communities, but not a lot of Orthodox or observant students. Um, so learning a little bit more about what that looks like, if that's something that's important for you, if you want a large Orthodox community, or if you're okay with a smaller but close-knit uh, group of, of other students who are observant. Um, finding out about the kosher meal options. A lot of schools will list that they have kosher dining, but it may be some wrapped up sandwiches in the corner of one dining hall probably not what you want to eat for the next four years. So really learning more about that. Um, thinking about the admissions process and the admissions requirements. Highly selective schools are going to be looking for students who've taken the most um, rigorous course load that we offer. Um, <coughs> thinking about whether that uh, is realistic for you. Um, in terms of testing, you heard some about testing tonight. Yes, the landscape for uh, the future of what testing requirements will look like for you when you apply is a little bit murky at this point, um, but there are a lot of colleges that have been test optional. They were long before COVID and they will continue to be. So if standardized testing is not your strength, you can look into colleges that don't require that, that piece. Um, and of course, as we've mentioned, thinking realistically about the cost and about what kind of financial aid is available and making sure that the colleges that you're pursuing are going to be realistic uh, options for your family financially. Um, so these are just some of the things that you can start thinking about. Uh, and again, it's going to look slightly different for each one of you. So what's next? <clears throat> well, you all being the, the, final, the final group, You've gotten a lot of information shared with you tonight. It's, it's likely a lot to process. So our first piece of advice, the first step you should take is take some time to process, right? Take some time to debrief, both on your own as a family, but just take some time to digest everything uh, that we've shared with you tonight. Uh, and, and, and like we've said, there's gonna be a follow-up email with um, everything that we've shared tonight and a plus a little extra. Uh, so when you are ready, right, when you've taken that time to process, then we have some homework assignments for everybody, parents and students. Homework, nobody said there would be homework. So tomorrow you're going to get uh, an email that will contain the recordings from tonight. So if you wanna review uh, anything that we covered, you will get a link to, to our college counseling handbook that uh, goes into much greater detail than we've been able to share tonight and other topics. We'll also have some hard copies available if you're old school like I am and you like to read off of paper, we'll have those available. Um, and these homework assignments, these are some resources that you can use to have these discussions as a family. One is, uh, a document that you can start to complete that helps you think about fit and which of these things are going to be most significant for you when you um, begin to make your college list. And the other is uh, a document that you can use to, to think about the cost of college. There's the tuition and then there's a lot of other fees that come along um, with enrolling in college. So give you a chance to, to work on some of those. Um, hopefully you can get a chance to uh, work on these together as a family before we start our individual meetings so that we have a good um, jumping off point uh, to our, our next step in this process. Keep an eye out for announcements about the workshops that we'll be hosting. Some of those will be in school for students. Some of those will be evening uh, activities like this uh, for parents to join as well. 
And right after the start of 2022, you will get a message from uh, one of the two of us uh, giving you uh, some information about how to schedule that initial college counseling uh, appointment. Of course, you do not need to wait until then. If you have questions at any point, you can feel free to reach out to one or both of us um, with any questions, small or large. Uh, that's, that's what we're here for. Absolutely. So, I think we have like one minute for any questions if you have a pressing question right now. Um, otherwise, we'll be happy to, to answer those later. Looks like it is time for us to- 20 seconds. Oh, 20 seconds, all right.